Good afternoon. My name is Angela Panmaka, and I'm the designated federal officer for the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Welcome to all of our virtual attendees. Today, NSCI commissioners will hold their last meeting to formally approve the final report and recommendations to Congress and the administration. This meeting is being live streamed to allow members of the public to attend the virtual meeting. It is also being recorded and will be posted on our website. As we begin our live stream plenary meeting, allow me to share a few procedural remarks. This commission is an independent presidential advisory committee operating under the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act. Today's meeting was announced in a Federal Register notice on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. We've received more than 100 RSVPs from members of the public, along with 22 members of the press. The public has been invited to submit written comments for the commission to consider. Two comments were received through our invitation and are considered public, which will also be posted along with the meeting minutes. There were no changes to today's meeting agenda as posted on the commission's website. Depending on time constraints, there may be an opportunity for members of the public to provide written comments or questions to the commission today. For those joining us via the live stream on YouTube, you can provide comments or questions via our YouTube live meeting comment section and via Twitter by tweeting or messaging at AI Commission. With that, I say welcome and call this meeting to order. I now turn this meeting over to the commission's executive director, Ili Bajraktari for his opening remarks. Good afternoon. My name is Ili Bajraktari and I serve as the executive director to the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. It is my pleasure to welcome commissioners as well as members of the public participating via our live, live, live stream to today's plenary meeting. When we started our journey two years ago, Little did we know what was in front of us. What we encountered was willingness and hope among many friends and allies to get our mission from Congress right to maintain our country's advantage in artificial intelligence. We enjoyed support from US departments and agencies. Many of them loaned us resources, including detailing both civilian and military personnel and dedicated countless hours to help us understand their missions and priorities. Members of Congress and congressional staff worked closely with us to accelerate our government's adoption of AI for national security purposes. Over the course of the commission's work, we engaged with hundreds of representatives from the private sector, academia, civil society, and across the government. We received countless briefings, classified and unclassified. We found consensus among nearly all of our partners on three points. The conviction that AI is an enormously powerful technology acknowledgement of the urgency to invest more in AI innovation and responsibility to develop and use AI guided by democratic principles. We also talked to our allies, old and new, from New Delhi to Tel Aviv to London. There was a willingness and desire to work with the United States to deepen cooperation on AI. I'm thankful to many individuals who volunteered with us, interned with us, provided expertise, and were friends of the commission. I'm particularly grateful to the dedicated full-time staff of the commission, who in many cases stepped away from important jobs to join this essential mission. In the last two years, we encountered widespread hope that AI could generate, generate incredible benefits for our nation's net economy, welfare, and security. We also heard concern that AI, like any technology, could create new challenges and exacerbate existing problems. We listened and took those concerns seriously. We ultimately came away with the recognition that if America embraces and invests in AI based on our values, it will transform our country and ensure the United States and its allies continue to shape the world for the good of all humankind. To NSAI commissioners, the final report <clears throat> reflects your tireless efforts towards our mission. In the weeks following our plenary sessions in January and February of this year, our staff has taken the edits from your public deliberations and incorporated them into this final document. I'm proud to present it to you today for your official vote and approval. But before I do that, let me remind everyone, our work is only the beginning. These recommendations, if endorsed, must be implemented. We will work tirelessly for the life of the commission to help turn your ideas and recommendations into actions. After opening statement by the chair and the vice chair, other commissioners will be able to provide additional statements. We will then take a vote on the final report. After the vote, the commission will open up for questions from the media and the public joining us today. Before I ask Dr. Schmidt and Mr. Ward for their opening remarks, I want to thank them for their tremendous 
opportunity and all other commissions that have put trust in me and the staff in the last two years. This was a team effort. And I would like to ask now Dr. Schmidt for his opening remarks. Um, it, it's been a fantastic privilege to serve as part of this commission and to be the chairman of this commission. And the report that we have put together, I think, will be seen as the most accurate statement of what was known at the time of its publication today. Um, the remarkable thing for me has been the leadership of Illy and his team, and in particular, the seamless way in which the teams work together. Each of the commissioners were, was a specialist in one or more areas. Each of the commissioners had a set of staff members they worked with very closely. We got a lot of feedback from everyone else. And I think when you all read our, our report, and especially if you read all 900 pages, you'll see the level of depth that we were able to get to. When I look at the report today, um, let me describe it first as divided into two parts. The first part is defending America in the AI era and recommending how uh, the US government can responsibly use AI technologies to protect the American people and our interests. It focuses on implications and applications for AI for defense and national security. The second part, winning the technology competition, recommends actions that the government must take to promote AI innovation to improve national competitiveness and protect critical US advantages in the bigger strategic competition with China. Couldn't be clearer. We ended up with roughly four pillars of action. And let me just summarize them. And you'll see them in the report, both at the executive summary as well as uh, throughout. The first is a leadership point. If I've learned anything in studying the way the government works, leadership, especially from the top, is critical to get the bureaucracy to move to the next challenge and the next opportunity. So we're proposing the setting up of a technology competitiveness council at the White House and the DOD and the IC should be organized as well for this competition. Second, talent. You have to have a message and a leader, but you have to have the talent to do it. We have a huge talent deficit. We need to build two talent, new talent and expand existing programs in government. And we need the world's best to come and stay to cultivate homegrown talent. And we go through all the specifics there as well. Third, hardware. It's really important that our hardware um, stay ahead, be cutting edge, and we are very close to losing the cutting edge microelectronics with power our companies and our military because of our reliance on Taiwan. We need to revitalize domestic semiconductor manufacturing and ensure that we're two generations ahead of China. Fourth, innovation. AI research is gonna be incredibly expensive. So we need the government to help set up the conditions for accessible domestic AI innovation. And we have taken you through over the last year, some very specific proposals uh, around the establishment of a national AI research infrastructure. And we need more money. I'm sorry to say, but we do need more money uh, in, a, in a particular in AI R&D so that by 2026, we get to $32 billion per year. And we spent a lot of time as a commission on two themes that cut across these pillars. The first is partnerships and coalitions, which Jilly already spoke about. And the second is responsible use of AI. We will need democratic allies in this competition and we'll, we must keep democratic values at the forefront of our decisions on using AI. I'm so proud of the transparency and the inclusivity of our approach. And with that, Bob, what would you like to say? Thanks, Eric, and good afternoon to everyone who's joining us. Today. I'd just like to step back for a minute and reflect upon what the commission has done. We had our first meeting in March of 2019, and since then, the commissioners or the staff or a combination thereof have had hundreds of meetings with experts and interest groups. Our line of effort groups that Eric spoke to uh, have met multiple times, and we've been seen as a full commission 10 times. Now, Eric and I wanted to have this to be an action-oriented commission from the beginning, and we didn't want to wait until today to provide our recommendations to Congress and the executive branch. We provided our, <clears throat> we provided our first interim report in November 2019. Then we followed those with quarterly reports, another interim report, and we also did a series of papers on COVID-19. 
And we worked hand in glove with the executive and legislative branches on these recommendations. And many of them have already been written into this year's NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act. Now, why have we approached this with such a serious sense of urgency? <clears throat> the first is all of the commissioners are convinced that AI-enabled threats are going to be a big threat to free and open societies in the future. AI tools will be weapons of first resort, particularly between great powers. Cyber attacks and disinformation will be accelerated by AI. We don't believe there's any debate over this point. Adversaries are going to use AI to take advantage of our societies as well as all democratic societies, <clears throat> digital dependence. And they will try to transform personal and commercial vulnerabilities into potential national security weaknesses. Russia's use of bots, false uh, or fake online personas are just the tip of the iceberg. Once those are combined with AI, uh, the threat becomes much more of a problem. So let me highlight just a few areas building on Eric's point. First, White House leadership. The president has stated very clearly that we have to prepare for a long-term competition with China. And we believe we have powerful bipartisan consensus to win the technology competition with our strategic competitors. The next necessary step is to organize to compete and win that competition. New technology is the organizing concept. <clears throat> Bill Burns, who has been nominated to be the director of central intelligence, said in his confirmation hearing that technology is the central pillar of the China challenge. And we agree with them on that. It is organized, committed, and resourced, determined to surpass us in all advanced technologies, AI among them. And we have no equivalent plans or organization at the government level, which should be a concern to all of us. We recommend we establish a technology competitive council in the report. The US has no mechanism to organize for a tech competition. Now, for other areas, we built structures for priorities. We built the National Security Council at the end of World War II to manage a long-term competition with the Soviet Union. And we uh, established the National Economic Council at the end of the Cold War. We need this same type of approach at the White House level by establishing the Technology Competitiveness Council, we believe should be chaired by the Vice President and includes all the cabinet secretaries to develop and oversee a strategic national approach to emerging technologies like AI. Now, taking leadership through the defense lens, since this is a national security commission, our armed forces competitive military technical advantage could be lost within the next decade if we do not accelerate the adoption of AI and other advanced technologies across their missions. Our major military rivals are really all in on military AI applications. <clears throat> Defending against AI capable adversaries without employing AI is an invitation to disaster. AI enabled applications will operate at machine speeds and humans simply will not be able to keep up with them without help from their own algorithms and their own AI. <clears throat> we need ubiquitous AI capabilities inserted into our military applications, and we need to develop new operational concepts which exploit them. Now, a constant message from our com uh, commissioners is 50% of all AI adoption in big organizations about changing the culture of the organization. It's not technology per se. Only leadership can do this. So we recommend forming a steering committee on emerging technology in DOD, just like we recommended forming the Technology Competitiveness Council at the national level. And this is going to, we think it should be composed of defense and intelligence community leaders that would develop and oversee the implementation of technology annexes to both our national defense and national intelligence strategies. At all agencies, technologists have to be empowered and given seats 
at the decision-making table. I just want to foot stomp what Eric said on talent. We have to think beyond incremental moves here. We need to build new pipelines from scratch to bring talent into the government. <clears throat> we need that talent to buy, build, and use AI technology. We think we should uh, establish agency-specific digital core and a national reserve digital core to create a steady pipeline of tech talent into the government through the US Digital Service Academy. For national competitiveness, we think we should pass a National Defense Education Act number two. The demand for AI talent and proficiency is expanding across all of the services, all of the cabinets, and all of the agencies. We must deepen our domestic talent pool accordingly through K through 12 STEM education, undergraduate and graduate fellowships, reskilling initiatives, and stronger pathways for high skilled immigration. As Eric mentioned, two themes cut across the pillars for AI leadership. The first one are partnerships. We believe the US has to build a coalition of like-minded democratic nations to advance the development and use of AI and emerging technologies in accordance with democratic values and build interoperability among our defense partners. The second theme builds upon this responsible use of AI and emphasizing our democratic values. We studied the ethical and legal questions very carefully as a commission. It was a, it was a subject of serious debate. And we fundamentally believe DOD has the policies and practices in place to use AI-enabled and autonomous weapons responsibly. AI-enabled systems can make targeting more precise and reduce civilian casualties. The bottom line, again, is we don't feel this is the time for incremental toggles to federal research budgets or adding a few new positions in the Pentagon for Silicon Valley technologists. Those just won't cut it. This will, be an ex this will be expensive and require a significant change in mindset at the national and agency and cabinet levels. America needs White House leadership, cabinet member action, and bipartisan congressional support to win the AI competition and the broader technology competition. Our final report, presents an integrated national strategy or blueprint for action to reorganize the government, reorient the nation and rally our closest allies and partners to defend and compete in the coming era of AI accelerated competition and conflict. I just wanna do a shout out to our staff. In my view, this is the most high performing staff inside the national capital region. They have just been astounding. Uh, and I think I speak for all of the commissioners when I say this report reflects their really kind of 24-7 dedication to the mission and giving us uh, such a report. I'd also encourage everyone listening to visit our website. It is world class and will help you navigate through this very dense report uh, and pull out any nuggets or information that interests you. Uh, and with that, I think I will turn it back over to Illy so we can hear from our commissioners. Uh, I'll open up the floor uh, for any comments uh, should commissioners decide to say anything. Yeah, I'm happy to make a comment. Uh, just to lead on to Eric and Bob's comments, I just want to say a couple of words about the experience. It's, it's been such an honor uh, to work closely with my fellow commissioners uh, and the truly excellent staff supporting the commission over the last two years. Uh, you know, just to, to reflect, we've had good dialogue and debate across all of the lines of effort over the two years. We came to good convergence around assessments and recommendations about advances in AI across quite a broad spectrum of national security issues. Uh, I believe uh, that the guidance in the report will be quite important for the vibrancy and national security of the United States uh, and our country's leading role among nations in pursuing freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. 
Now, beyond the US, a number of recommendations are important for other nations to take note of, including long-term friends and allies, as well as rival nations. Cooperation and coordination on several fronts will be an important part of collaboration among like-minded partners, as well as for efforts and relationships among hard-charging competitors. I'd like to make a special call out to uh, my fellow commissioners and the staff on the line of effort on AI advances in R&D, where I spent a great deal of, of time. It's been great to deliberate and to debate on where things are with AI technologies and where they are going at the frontiers of our understanding. Uh, and, and an extra special call out to fellow commissioners and the incredible staff on the line of effort that I had the honor of chairing. This was the commission's effort on trustworthiness and responsibility around AI. And this includes critical and evolving topics on ethics, privacy, civil liberties, and civil rights. The US has a, an important uh, opportunity and a critical responsibility to lead with its values and to set norms for the world around the responsible development and fielding of AI technologies. So in sum, I'm gonna miss the close work with all my colleagues on the, on the commission, uh, but the friendships will, will certainly go on. Uh, thanks uh, everyone for the support and the collegiality. I've had a great time and even though it's been a bunch of work. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next, Katharina McFarlane. Thank you, Yili, and thanks to everyone, especially our chairs. Uh, the chair and co-chair really helped lead us and took a lot of the weight off of our shoulders in addition to the staff. So I commend each of the leads and co-leads for each of these efforts, but particularly our chair and co-chair, thank you. I'd also like to sort of give a little bit of a background because I think the report speaks for itself, but perhaps people would like to have a little bit of an insight into the work that was done to get us there. Uh, and a tremendous support from the IC to bring us to a baseline assessment to understand and really open our eyes to the whole gamut, if you would, of what AI has been used for and how it's been used and where it could be used and its dual use. There's a really yin and yang to the AI. And I think as Eric just stated, we as a nation need to stand out taking our values to the table and leading. I think anyone who's an industry person realizes if you invest in yourselves, you reap the rewards. And so I hope that everyone that picks up this report and then takes advantage of taking that implementation plan that we're working on to heart and make it work because it's our future. Um, one thing that I would also like to say is that I think as we grew as a group, our staff, Yilly and our members became the brightest members of our group. I think if everyone would take an opportunity out there to take a close look at these people, we need to find the places where they can bring all of that talent to bear to help us. Because not only do they carry a, a huge amount of knowledge, they have energy and they have real value um, that we have really taken a benefit from, benefit from all around. So kudos to them and I hope people recognize and that we as a nation take advantage of this crew here who I've come to really love and uh, will work my hardest to help them along and I'm sure all of us will. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to Safra who led my particular section on national security and Eric on the ethics and uh, Chris and everyone who did all this hard work. I really, really appreciated it. And I loved working and learning so much from all the talent that was here. Thank you, Katharina. Safra Katz. I wanted to start by just thanking everyone for the incredible work. And I wanna also point out that we meant this to be a wake up call. There are some very, very bold actions we're asking for. They are, they are asking in many cases for us to break out from our historical silos and work together. This is pretty much the critical moment for our country and the investment that's necessary. None of it is meant for all the different companies and people who are on this. It's meant really for our nation because for us to be successful in the next century, it is absolutely critical that we work together with our friends and allies and we boldly change the way we've been doing things and make sure that our government has the best technology in the world. And it's, um, it's a critical moment for all of us. It is a wake up call. And um, 
I think it's been very important for me personally. It's been a privilege to work with such talented people. The, the commissioners are truly incredible. And I think we've made some lifelong friends and the staff is superb. I only wish I could work with them forever. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to working to the implementation of this. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Gil Gilman Louis next. Thank you very much. First, I wanna thank the public the institutions, companies, the departments and agencies, as well as our allies for their expertise and the input that allowed the commissioners and the staff to create this comprehensive report. We must unite as a nation to make AI a national priority. The commission believes AI should serve humankind, not the other way around. It is our hope that AI will help bring all of us together to make our lives safer, to improve the quality of life for all, and to help unleash the power of future generations to make our nation and the world a better and safer place. Thank you. Thank you, Gilman. Uh, Dr. Chin next. Uh, thank you, Ili. Uh, first, I wanna just state that it's been a tremendous honor to serve on this commission. Uh, I appreciate very much the incredible and diverse talents of the, the commission and the staff. To me, this commission and staff represents what is the best and the greatest about the United States of America that people from such diverse backgrounds, different perspectives can come together for a common purpose to work for the public good, to work for the good of all of humanity. In the United States, we have a tremendous responsibility. We have the tools to affect change in the world. We have an incredible pool of talent. The US is still the locus of AI technology development and this country has incredible resources. What we must do in the future is we must demonstrate the will to carry through on this responsibility. We must embark in particular in the use of AI for the good of the entire world and in particular in these emerging areas of information, cyber and space. This will take a joint effort from the government, academia and industry all working together. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. We must be persistent and thoughtful and we must not give up, we must persevere. I'm going to reiterate the comment that Bob Work made, which is that the largest and most challenging part of this is the cultural change to affect AI that will change the way that we do all orders of business in this country not just in national security, but in all orders of business. The future leadership in this area is up to us as a country to bring the tremendous potential of artificial intelligence and its societal benefits to the good of all of humanity and not just the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mignon Kleiber. Thank you. This report acknowledges a human deficit in AI and highlights what that means for winning the technology competition. But what it also affirms is our ability to address that challenge and win. While we may actually have, and we acknowledge a workforce talent scarcity in AI, what we do not have is a deficit when it comes to our potential to narrow and address these gaps. With the whole of government, whole of academia, whole of private sector, philanthropy, civil society, and whole of nation and allies approach, we can accelerate innovation and defend against malign AI uses. I am more confident, ev confident than ever of our ability to do so and wish to thank an exceptionally talented and SCAI staff and my fellow commissioners for affirming this promise through this report in our recommendations. It has been an honor to serve and I am grateful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ili. Thank you, Mignon. Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths is next. Thank you, Ili. Um, I just want to add a, a couple of comments to uh, what my fellow commissioners have said. It has been, um, and we, we've been involved in 
what I think is a most impressive process. And therefore we have produced impressive results. The results not being just the report, but a set of truly actionable and vetted recommendations that together uh, make a whole. It's the whole of this report, the whole of the recommendations, all of the work that's gone on that will make a difference. I hope that we have conveyed to everyone this collective sense of urgency. And while we, uh, we, we see that urgency there, we want to be deliberate and not rash. Uh, but there at the same time, I repeat what Safra has said, there was a need for bold action. So incrementalism or passivity will lose us the lead. Uh, we have to make bold moves. So I hope people take that and understand it. Um, I have to make a comment that I was absolutely delighted that talent needs and the talent competition took basically a key role rather than an adjunct role. You know, so many times people focus on the exciting parts of this world, the technologies and what it can do for you, and then workforce and talent comes after the fact. And through this process, talent has come through from every single working group um, as very, very important. And I was pleased as, as, a, um, as a, a, an ex educator to see that. The other thing that I thought we did from the very, very beginning, from our very first meeting, we talked about the importance of principles and responsible use. Uh, and again, that's often an afterthought. Okay, we've done all this. Oh my gosh, let's think now about how we actually go about this in the appropriate way. So once again, I come back to the process that was set up from the very beginning, from our first meeting about the areas that we were going to look at, how we were going to organize ourselves, how the staff were organized to provide support. All of this, I think, has led to this, what I call this very impressive um, result. But I also think the report and all the recommendations represent a hopeful future. Um, it's not the end of the world. This isn't going to be disaster for us. There is real hope there and lots of opportunities. And the opportunities exist for everybody who's engaged in this world right now, but also for new participants who can come in. And I think also a hopeful future for the young people of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Griffiths. And Jesse? Yeah, I have two brief comments. Um, you know, first, uh, I would echo that it's, it's just been an honor to be on this commission and to work with my fellow commissioners and, and this amazing and committed staff. Um, I think this commission uh, uh, and the staff who come from all sorts of different professional backgrounds have worked very effectively together to build a thoughtful report and set of recommendations. I think secondly, I, I really hope that Congress deeply considers the report and its recommendations. I agree with Dr. Griffiths that there is a lot of hope here, but I also think there's meaningful urgency to get moving on these needs. And it's important to realize that you can't just flip a switch and have these capabilities in place. It takes steady, committed hard work over a long period of time to bring these capabilities to fruition. All of us I know are eager to get going on these recommendations and to help in whatever way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Dr. Ford. Well, uh, my colleagues have uh, already made most of the comments that I thought to make. And as others have said, it's been a real honor to serve on the commission and to collaborate with such an exceptional staff and most importantly, the fellow commissioners. Uh, in a nutshell, I think this report lays out an actionable path toward a positive AI-enabled future. And I hope uh, folks enjoy reading it, and I hope it serves as a blueprint for action. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that, uh, I would uh, thank all the commissioners for your statement uh, and the incredible support. Now I would like to request the chair or the vice chair make a motion for the formal vote on the final report. Uh, most common words in the English language, you're muted. Uh, let's make a motion to uh, approve the final report. Is there a second motion? Second. Thank you, Katharina. I will now call the roll. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Eric Schmidt. Um, I vote to approve. Thank you. Bob Work. I vote to approve. Safra Katz. I vote to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Chen. I vote to approve. 
Thank you. Mignon Clyburn. I vote to approve. Uh, I'm going to read a statement on behalf of Chris Darby Commission, who's not going to be with us today. Uh, Chris Darby was unable to attend today's meeting, but has expressed his vote in favor of the report as written. His official statement will be reflected in the minute meetings. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Ford. I vote to approve. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Josie Marie Griffiths. I vote to approve. Dr. Eric Horvitz. I vote to approve the final report and its associated materials. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, I've abstained from the development of the recommendations related to improving government partnership with the private sector on technology development found in chapters two and 11 and their associated blueprints for action in order to prevent a potential conflict or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horvitz. Andy Jassy. I vote to approve. Thank you. Gilman Louis. I vote to approve. Thank you. Dr. Bill Mark. I vote to approve. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor to serve. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Jason Matheny served on the commission from the start and until just recently when he was asked by President Biden to join the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He was instrumental in many of the commission's recommendations and an incredible valuable member of the NSEAI. So with that, I'll turn it to Katharina McFarland. I vote to approve, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Moore. Uh, I vote to approve and I'd like to say why. We are the human race. We are tool users. It's kind of what we're known for. And we've now uh, hit the point where our tools are in some limited sense more intelligent than ourselves. Uh, and it's a very exciting future, which uh, uh, we have to take seriously for the, for the benefit of the United States and the world. Uh, I have a similar uh, addendum to uh, uh, Dr. Horvitz. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, I've abstained from the development of the recommendations related to improving government partnership with the private sector. Uh, and again, this is in order to prevent a potential conflict or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I believe that all the commissioners have formally approved the final report. And as the executive director, on behalf of you, I will submit and transmit the final report to Congress and the president. With that, I'll turn over to Chair Eric Schmidt and Vice oh, Chair I Bob think... before we turn over to the public. No, I think we should congratulate ourselves for actually getting something done in the middle of the pandemic. And the impact of this thing is going to be pretty significant. I think we should move to questions from the audience and from the press. How, we're, how will we be working on that? So I'll call Tara Rigler, our Director for Engagement and Outreach, to lead this conversation. Thank you, Yuli. Uh, I will go ahead and start reading questions from the press who are online today. They've submitted their questions. First is from Yasmin Tajay, National Defense Magazine. Her questions are to Chairman Schmidt and Vice Chairman Bob Work. The first is to Chairman Schmidt. You have previously said the United States is two years ahead of China in artificial intelligence. How will the recommendations in this report better posture the United States to counter China? If these recommendations are implemented fully, how much further ahead could the United States be? Uh, <clears throat> some of this is my personal view. Um, my concern is actually that we are ahead, but that they are catching up. And that the activities that we describe in the report are necessary to stay ahead. It's not at all obvious to me that they will allow us to get significantly ahead. Um, but we did a great deal of research in looking at where China was, and they have a massive investment in this area with many, many, many smart people working on it. We have every reason to think that the competition with China will increase. Thank you. And the second question for Mr. Work, what kind of reception do you expect the final report to have in the, Hill, in the administration and on the Hill? Do you think there are any recommendations that may prove to be controversial or receive pushback? Well, anytime you have a commission like this, uh, it's impossible to satisfy every single stakeholder. Uh, but we hope, as we have said over and over, uh, this isn't a time for incremental steps. Uh, we have to take bold action. And anytime you take bold action, uh, conservative elements of the government want to say, let's take a look at this more, et cetera. We feel as a commission that this is not the time to for paralysis by analysis. The report says we think we need to be AI ready by 2025. 
what we are discussing here is having the talent pool starting to look a lot better than it does today, uh, that we are organized with the technology competitiveness uh, uh, committee that we have established. Uh, Jake, the Joint AI Center is the AI accelerator in the Department of Defense. And when you put all of these things together, we think you get momentum and you really start uh, to see progress. So we would be naive to think that everyone would just take the report, push the I believe button and go. But I will say that we have received extraordinary support from Congress and they have already laid in many of our re recommendations in the National Defense Authorization Act. And as a commission, we are hopeful that they will take many more of the recommendations and push them forward. Thank you. The second question is from Andrew Everson from C4 ISRnet. This question is for Dr. Schmidt, Mr. Work, and any other commissions who would like to add. His question is, what are the initial steps that need to be taken by DOD or Congress to ensure DOD is AI ready by 2025? Why don't we have some of the commissioners answer these questions, not just uh, Bob and me? Who would like to start? I'll start. This is Safra. So um, listen, this is uh, hundreds of pages of report that really go through a lot of, frankly, initial steps. Um, as uh, just as both Eric and Bob mentioned, um, this requires significant change in organizational structure. This requires a lot of collaboration, both within the Department of Defense, within the entire US government and with our allies. That is absolutely critical, our organization. And secondly, of course, leadership. There is no way to change the, the future without very focused leadership in all of these organizations, whether it's coming from the White House, the Department of Defense and in Congress. Those two things are initially critical. And of course, ultimately making sure you have the funding to follow through on that. But the truth is, you know, you ask what are the initial steps, but there are so many important steps that have to be done now. I would say there are four big things that we should really step, put the accelerator down on. The first is leadership from the top. As everyone has said, this is about changing the culture of the entire government. So we think the Technology Competitiveness Council at the White House and similar ones in both the DOD and IC, we should establish those right away. They should be working together to establish national plans so that we can get after it. The second one, as uh, Jose Marie and uh, uh, Mignon have said, talent is the key. So one of our big ideas is to have a digital service academy. And we have a lot of support on that from Congress. That is something we could do right away. It will take a, maybe a year to stand up, but that will help us get AI ready by 2025. The third thing is hardware. And the first question from Jasmine, you know, the two years, what we were saying is we have a two generation lead on China in advanced hardware, advanced microchips. And what we say is that we're 110 miles away from going from two generations ahead to maybe two generations behind. In other words, if China absorbed Taiwan, which is the source of many of the world's uh, hardware, that would really be a competitive problem for us. So we wanna stay two generations ahead of China in microelectronics and we lay out how we think we should do that with a microelectronic strategy. And finally, as everyone has said, this isn't gonna be cheap. Uh, we recommend that we double each year the amount we're investing in AI research and development until we get to 32 billion a year in 2026. And that will allow us to maintain the momentum. So I think those four things are kind of the pillars of the entire report. Hey, next question, Tara. 
Yes, it's from Dimitri from Financial Times. Uh, for Mr. Work, in terms of AI with military application, where is China leapfrog or about to leapfrog the US? How concerned are you that the polarization in US politics makes it hard for the US to come up with sustainable strategies, while the authoritarian nature of the Chinese regime makes their planning much easier? Let's have the commissioners answer this. I think, Andrew, can you t handle the leapfrog one? Sure, yes. I'll give uh, a strong example is in the world of surveillance. And uh, the, uh, we are concerned that the, uh, the Chinese have basically been running massive uh, experiments on, uh, frankly, very Orwellian technology. I think we're proud but cautious about the fact that we uh, in the West have actually been extremely concerned and careful to limit uh, the development of technology for surveillance outside international norms. And I'm really pleased with the fact, for example, that our major technology companies have been really cautious about doing things like releasing facial recognition uh, software. So that, I think this is a great example of the paradox of what we have to do here. We have to develop technology which uh, preserves our Western uh, values, but we have to be prepared for a world in which uh, not everyone is doing that. Let me add to uh, that set of comments that Andrew just said about China. You know, there are some advantages of having a monolithic government who can direct both government and um, commercial resources as one. Um, but I am also greatly confident in a democratic system that allows for robust debate. And we have lots of viewpoints on the ethical use of AI, where we should put the research dollars, what are useful and practical applications of AI, and where AI should not go. I think the democratic process will yield a better set of AI solutions even if it takes us a little bit longer than an approach that does not have that same kind of debate or input. Does anyone else question? want to add? Okay, no, next let's, question. Let's, Tara, let's, let's keep going because I want to get through the reporter's okay. question. So Matt O'Brien, Associated Press, how do you respond to concerns these recommendations are coming from a panel with the membership heavily weighted towards the tech executives and government contractors? Uh, so let me step in on it. Um, so uh, I, I think that the commission was very uniform in its findings that we feel that there are multiple elements in the AI ecosystem and they are all needed to effectively marshal our national response in artificial intelligence. So we need the United States government to fundamentally change how it is doing business to embrace AI. And that includes both the national labs, the FFRDCs, the UARCs, and the civil agencies, as well as the national security agencies. We need academia, we need industry, we need traditional defense contractors, we need the tech technology companies, uh, and we also need small businesses. We feel that they all play a very important role uh, in this tremendous change that is happening in the national security area, as well as the economic security area. If I can just add to Steve uh, on the, the, the question on the composition of the panel. Um, I've been deeply impressed by the engagement in all of our deliberations with experts from the outside across a spectrum of sectors. Uh, this was, was in an ongoing uh, consultation as well as in formal uh, sessions with civil society organizations, multiple ac academics. Uh, with, when it comes to the organizations, uh, you know, we, this included the work with, with the ACLU, uh, Partnership on AI, uh, we engage with the United Nations, uh, and, and so I, I was. We, it was we, these were great learnings for the commissioners and for the staff. Uh, but it was a really a, a, a quite a bit of investment was done in outreach and inreach. Okay, thank you. A question from Jackson Barnett at FedScoop: Was there a briefing or document that particularly illuminated the national security threat of AI and military applications? I'd be happy to take that. No, there wasn't any specific briefing or document. It was a compilation of multiple. 
Okay, the next question is from Jory Heckman with Federal News Network. How has the commission's thinking for the Digital Service Academy and Digital Service Academy evolved over the past year? And how would these recommendations address the AI talent gap in the federal workforce? Don't press that skip ad button. I can guarantee it will be the biggest financial mistake of your life. Do I life. jump in? I can hear some <laughs> background noise. I'm happy to jump in. The, uh, we did. Um, we felt that the uh, recommendation that to establish a U.S. Digital Service Academy was a very bold recommendation. Um, but one that was necessary. And we considered a, a different configurations of how that might actually be accomplished as we went out and talked with other people. There was a thought at one point that it could be accomplished through a network of academic institutions. But we felt in the end that that really would do no more than the uh, current uh, cyber core scholarship, for the scholarships for service activities, which we had recommended be increased for artificial intelligence. The main reason why we went, <clears throat> went forward with a recommendation for a single new entity and a new university was the uh, leadership culture that could be developed <clears throat> within a single institution. If you develop things through a network, you don't quite get that cultural component. And we feel that the federal government increasingly needs a new leadership core, if you like, coming through and, uh, and, and being constantly replenished so that the uh, government um, can continue to evolve its capabilities in technology in, in, an, in an unending way. So that was the reason we felt that it complements the uh, scholarship for service activities and it's complemented by the other uh, recommendations we made for the uh, talent development and workforce. And this is Mignon Clyburn. If you look at the other uh, recommendations, what it addresses to me are the barriers uh, that exist, barriers of uh, individuals who might not have the economic wherewithal uh, to uh, be able to on a board educationally the traditional uh, ramps, uh, the ability for them um, after um, you know service to get um, up to five years of um, experience they may not have been, uh, uh, that they may not that may not have been available uh, to them. So with these recommendations in a cluster, um, you know, what we are acknowledging is there are a lot of talented people all across this nation that have various barriers uh, to economic, educational, and other uh, uh, capabilities or abilities um, that would perpetuate and to address um, uh, this um, AI deficit and as a whole, in the aggregate, um, we seek to address that. Thank you, Ms. Clyburn. Question from Day Prayer from MLX. Would like to ask about likelihood of CFIUS recommendations becoming law. Also broadly comment on what is the danger of unregulated FDI and, I and AI? Is it technology transfer? It's fine. I'm more than happy to uh, answer the CFIUS question. Um, is our recommendation as a recommending body to the Congress um, and to the executive branch that uh, they take the CFIUS recommendation seriously. And all indications are that um, members as well as, as the executive branch does. It's an important part on our protect side of the house on protecting um, uh, our AI. And I think um, while there's always a danger of direct foreign influence into our AI. The U.S. believes strongly in open research and open science. Um, it makes us different than some of our competitor nations in that. Uh, we will continue to invest in those areas. Um, but we also want to make sure that that's done in a fair and equitable way. Um, we think that spying actually undermines open research particularly um, leaks of information before that research is completed. Um, and we have made specific recommendations on how to deal with um, reducing the uh, effects of uh, those kinds of counterintelligence activities in our research institutions. Thank you, Mr. Louie. The final question goes to Leo Kellyan from BBC News. The draft report mentioned that you thought China could leapfrog U.S. and could lose military technical superiority within five years. 
Final report changes that to the next decade. Does that signify that you think existing export restrictions and other efforts have slowed Beijing's ambitions? I'm happy to answer that one too, discuss it in false export control. Um, this first on the timetable, um, China has made it clear that uh, in its uh, calendar, it would like to be able to catch the U.S. and the West by 2025 and surpass uh, the West by 2030 and AI capabilities. Um, so that's their timetable. I would say um, on the military issue of technology, uh, it is our great hope that like-minded uh, nations, democratic nations work together um, to make sure that technologies around AI um, does not leak into adversarial hands that would give them uh, an advantage over our systems and that we would unite together in a safe and uh, responsible deployment of this kind of technology in military systems. Thank you, Mr. Louis. Uh, Ili, those are all the questions I have from the press. Over to you for questions from the public. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, again, I just want to thank all the commissioners for the opportunity. Uh, our report is available online, so I uh, invite all of you to uh, look at the website, www.nscei.gov. Uh, and without further ado, before we close the meeting, I'll turn over to our co-chairs, Dr. Schmidt and Bob Work. I think, I think that uh, it, it bears repeating that to win in AI, we need more money, more talent, stronger leadership, and collectively, we as a commission believe this is a national security priority and that the steps that are outlined in the, in the, research, in the report represent not just our consensus, but also a distillation of hundreds and hundreds of uh, experts in policy and technology and ethics and so forth. So I encourage the public and everyone to follow our recommendations. Our work just begins now because we have to now sell this to the key uh, decision makers in our country, and we're committed to do so. Bob? I really don't have anything to add. You know, the this has been a very fast-paced two years, I have to say. Uh, and I know for the staff, uh, they're probably looking forward to having a couple of days off because they have been really going at full speed, 24-7. i just like to thank all the commissioners uh, for their hard work and for the hard work that's ahead for selling our recommendations, as Eric said. And uh, since this is our last mission meeting as the commissioners, I look forward to all of us meeting in person at some unknown but future date this year. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Angela Ponmanka to close the meeting as our FDO. Thank you for attending the commission's virtual meeting to approve the final report. This meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>